Well, let's open our Bibles to the book of Lamentations, shall we? Lamentations chapter 1, as we continue our study through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Of course, on Wednesday nights, we are going through the Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. On Sunday, we're going through the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation. And this way, we get the whole counsel of God, Wednesday and Sunday, to get through the entirety of Scripture. And of course, last time we were together, we finished up the book of Jeremiah, so we move right into the book of Lamentation. Now, before we get into chapter 1, there are a few things we want to look at by way of background and or introduction to the book, as we look at the who, what, where, when, why, and how of the book. So if you're taking notes or outlining, uh, we're going to look at seven things by way of background and or introduction to the book. Number one, first of all, let's take a look at the who. Who wrote the book? Uh, That was a question. Uh, (laughs) Okay, Jeremiah is a good guess, but ultimately we really don't know. Most scholars believe that Jeremiah wrote the book because Jeremiah is referred to as the weeping prophet. uh, And the book of Lamentations is a book of laments and weeping and mourning and grieving over the destruction of Jerusalem because of the sin of Judah. And according to Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 29, God told Jeremiah to have Judah, the southern kingdom, Lament. So some scholars see that as a one way of connecting Solomon to the book of or, uh, uh, Jeremiah to the book of Lamentations, and in Second Chronicles uh, thirty-five verse twenty-five, Jeremiah wrote a lamentation for Joshua, who was the sixteenth king of the southern kingdom of Judah. So when they put these things together, many scholars believe it was in fact Jeremiah. Number two, let's take a look at the what question. What is the purpose of the book? What's the book all about? Well, I I think it shows us that God judges sin. God is grieved by sin. And there are consequences for sin. Are you getting the picture? It's dealing with the result of sin in the life of Judah, which of course was the destruction of Jerusalem as we saw at the end of the book of Jeremiah. Now the book of Jeremiah looks forward to the destruction of Jerusalem because of sin, whereas the book of Lamentation looks backward at the destruction of Jerusalem because of sin. And in both books, Jeremiah weeps, mourns, and laments because of the destruction of God's holy city as a result of the sin in Judah. Number three, let's take a look at the where question. Where was the book written? Well, we really don't know. Many scholars believe it was written around Jerusalem or in Jerusalem, though we can't be sure. Now this brings us to the fourth thing we wanna look at, and that is the when. When was this book written? You say, surely we know that, Clark. No, we do not. Uh, (laughs) I know, we don't know much about it. Um, Most scholars believe it was written after the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C., but before Jeremiah was deported to um, Egypt in 583 BC. So it seems to fit in that three year period of time after the destruction of Jerusalem, but before the deportation of Jeremiah. Which brings us to a fifth thing, and that is why. Why is this book so important to you and to me? Well, I think it's important to us because we all grieve, we all mourn. We all lament. We all cry and weep at certain times in our lives. But the question is why? Why do we lament? Why do we mourn? Why do we grieve? Why do we weep? Do we, do we lament because of the loss of a, a possession? 
something expensive, something valuable? Do we cry and weep and moan because of our pride of, uh, in light of what somebody has said about us or what they have done to us? Are we lamenting over the world and the things in the world? Are we mourning and weeping over that which is temporal, that which is not going to last very long? Do we lament and mourn over circumstances and situations? Or, like Jeremiah, do we lament over those who've rejected God? Do we weep and mourn and cry over the lost? Does our heart break for those who don't know Jesus? Follow me? So this is why this book is so important. Because we all grieve, we all mourn, we all lament. But the question is, what are we crying over? Are we crying over the temporal or the eternal? Now, I understand that we lament and we grieve and we mourn over the loss of a loved one or a valuable heirloom and possession. I get it. But hopefully we understand that all these things are temporary and that hopefully our heart is bent for the lost, for those who are going to be eternally separated from God. And that's why this book is so important. Well, let's come to a sixth matter, and that's the how. How is this book divided? Well, these five chapters are divided into five sections. Each of these five chapters represents a separate lament or a dirge or it, it, they're written in poetic form when a 3-2 rhythm. Um, the first four chapters are given to us as an acrostic. Chapters 1, 2, and 4 all have 22 verses. And each verse corresponds to the 22 letters in the Hebrew Bible. So that's the acrostic in the Hebrew alphabet, rather, I'm sorry. Uh, so in the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 letters. So each verse in chapters 1, 2, and 4 corresponds to each of those letters. Now, chapter 3 has 66 verses. And it's set in three verse triplets. So every three verses represents the one letter in the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So you have three verses each with one letter or 66 verses. Now, chapter five, on the other hand, is not alphabetical at all, but it does follow the format of the 22 verse outline. Now, the book of Lamentations is read every year in the Jewish culture uh, during uh, July, August, and it commemorates the destruction of the temple, and it's read on every year on the ninth day of Av. It's the fifth month in the Jewish sacred calendar, and it commemorates the destruction of the temple not only by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., but by the Romans in 70 A.D., because both temples were destroyed on the ninth of Av. And so this book is read every year to commemorate the destruction of the temple. And I hope you're getting all this. There will be a test after class. Now, the seventh and final thing is the key verse. What is the key verse in the book? Well, I think it's in chapter 2, verse 11. Because if I had to pick a key verse, and I did, I went right to chapter 2, verse 11. It says, my eyes fail with tears. My heart is troubled. My bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the children and the infants faint in the streets of the city. So it would seem that chapter 2, verse 11, really sums up the book. It's a key verse for the book. As we've mentioned, it looks back to the destruction of Jerusalem because of sin in the southern kingdom of Judah. Now, this brings us to chapter 1 and the first acrostic, the 22 verses, each verse beginning with the letter of the Hebrew, by, Hebrew uh, alphabet. There are 22 of them. Now, we've divided chapter 1 into two very simple sections. Or we'll look at these two sections in light of two perspectives, we might say. 
the first section in verses 1 through 11 is seen through the perspective of somebody standing outside Jerusalem looking in. The second section, verses 12 through 22, is seen from the perspective of somebody standing inside Jerusalem looking out. So those are the two sections. Well, let's take a look at this first section, verses 1 through 11, dealing with somebody outside the city of Jerusalem looking in. And this, of course, is after the destruction by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Look at verse 1. Lamentations chapter 1, verse 1. How lonely sits the city, speaking of Jerusalem, that was full of people. How like a widow is she who was great among the nations, the princes among the provinces, has become a slave. Now this, of course, points to and speaks of the destruction of Jerusalem, as we've already mentioned. When Babylon sacked the city, destroyed the temple, and enslaved the people. And this is the byproduct or the result of sin. And in verse 1, it's threefold. In the first part of the verse, it left them alone. In the second part of the verse, it left them helpless, pictured here with the widow. And third, it left them enslaved. And friends, that is a picture of sin. Man, it leaves us alone, it leaves us helpless, and it brings us into bondage. Well, verse 2. It says, she weeps bitterly in the night. Her tears are on her cheeks among all her lovers. She has none to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Now, when it speaks of her lovers, it's speaking of those who um, were not against Jerusalem. And no doubt it points to and speaks of Egypt because when Babylon was laying siege to Jerusalem, unfortunately, the southern kingdom of Judah turned to Egypt for help and protection and they did not turn to God. And that really paints an interesting picture for us because Egypt is a type of the world. And when the enemy attacks us, and when we go through difficult times, trials, tribulation, tumult, we all have a choice to make. (laughs) We can turn to the Lord or we can turn to the world. And by the way, the world's not our friend. Hello? I don't know if you know this or not, but the world doesn't like us. The world hates us. And unfortunately, a lot of people turn to the world thinking the world's their friend. But the world is not our friend. (laughs) Jesus calls us friends. I think that's amazing. No, we need to turn to the Lord. We need to put our trust in the Lord because the the resources of the world are limited. But the resources of God are unlimited. And for each and every one of us, we've got a choice to make. Look, when difficulties come, man, when the enemy is on the warpath, We need to trust in the Lord. Well, verse 3, it goes on. It says, Judah has gone into captivity under affliction and hard servitude. She dwells among the nations, or literally the Gentiles. She finds no rest. All her persecutors overtake her in dire straits. And boy, what a picture that paints, because when we turn from the Lord, when we don't trust in the Lord, there's going to be captivity, servanthood, and no rest, no peace. You know, it always reminds me of what Sally had taught in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11. And she had talked about this quite often in the book of Hebrews, how we are to be diligent to enter into his rest. And that word diligent means to hurry up, (laughs) to make haste. Man, don't waste a minute in entering into the rest of Jesus Christ. Don't waste a second. Because listen, gang, there is no reason for us to live in turmoil in our hearts and in our lives. There's no reason for us to, to be upset and 
irritated and agitated about circumstances in our life or what's going on in our community, in our country, in our world. Hey, look, as we look around, as we watch the news, uh, I, I don't know if you recognize this or not, but we are circling the drain. Hey, listen, things aren't getting better. But you know, for you and I, we understand that's how it's supposed to be. Paul said in these last days, evil men and imposters are going to grow worse and worse. He didn't say they're going to get better and better. So for you and I, there's no reason to lose a minute of sleep over our personal circumstances or national situations or international circumstances because we know that God's on the throne and we know that he's orchestrating everything according to the counsel of his will. Ephesians 1.11 declares God's working all things according to the counsel of his will, whether we like it, agree with it, understand it or not. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of rest in that. Hebrews 4.11, man, we're to be diligent to enter his rest, enter his peace. And when we are in Christ, we have peace. Because Jesus, man, he is the giver of peace. John 14.27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Therefore, let not your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. Precious family, there's no reason to fear. There's no reason to, to lose rest, to lose peace. Because Jesus Christ has given us peace. You know, I always laugh when somebody asks for prayer and they say, pray that God gives me peace. I say, why, aren't you saved? Because if we're saved, we have peace. Because Jesus is not just the giver of peace. According to Ephesians 2.14, the Bible says he himself is our peace. So if you have Jesus, you have peace. So we ought to be walking around with that goofy Christian grin on our face all day long. A little bounce in our step, a whistle in our lips. And people, it freaks people out, by the way. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to act. I mean, you're just up, you're going, man, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> it's all good. God's on the throne. Look, as believers, everything's being filtered through his fingertips. He's either A, making it happen, or B, he's allowing it to happen. Either way, God's in charge. And I say hallelujah to that. Well, verse four, this section continues. Take a look. In verse four, it says the road's to Zion, another name for Jerusalem. It's one of the three little mounts there in Jerusalem. The roads to Zion mourn because no one comes to the set feast or the appointed feast. All her gates are desolate. Her priests sigh. Her virgins are afflicted. And she is in bitterness. Her adversaries have become the master. Her enemies prosper. For the Lord has afflicted her because of the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone into captivity before the enemy. And from the daughter of Zion, all her splendor has departed. Her princes have become like deer that find no pasture, that flee without strength before the pursuer. In the days of her affliction and roaming, Jerusalem remembers all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old. When her people fell into the hand of the enemy with no one to help her, the adversary saw her and mocked at her downfall. Jerusalem has sinned grievously. Therefore, she has become vile. All who honor her despise her because they have seen her nakedness. Yes, she sighs and turns away. Her uncleanness is in her skirts. She did not consider her destiny. Therefore, her collapse was awesome. She has no comforter. So all of this trouble, all of this tumult, all of the destruction and death and desolation came about as a result of sin. We've seen it time and time again through the book of Jeremiah. This is nothing new. We all understand how destructive and how devastating sin can be, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. So we've talked about this in great depth, but notice at the beginning of verse 9, in the second little stanza there, it says she did not consider 
her destiny. (laughs) She didn't consider her destiny. Jerusalem didn't look forward to the consequences of her actions, we might say. And boy, what a, a truth this ought to be for us. Because you know as well as I do, it's easy to get caught up in the moment. It's easy to jump on the bandwagon and follow the group, if you will. And sometimes it ends up in sin. And I think for us, we need to take that step back. And before we say anything, do anything, go anywhere, we should consider our destiny. (laughs) In other words, we should look ahead to the consequences of what we're about to say or what we're about to do. Because if we don't, man, devastation and destruction and desolation is on the horizon to be sure. Well, as we've mentioned, um, or maybe I didn't mention it in the introduction. No, I don't think I did. But But both of these sections we'll be looking at today, the first section, dealing with those outside looking in, they both end with a prayer. And in the middle of verse 9, down through verse 11, we have the conclusion to this first section with the prayer. Take a look. In the middle of verse 9, it says, O Lord, now here he turns to God and starts praying, Behold my affliction, for the enemy has magnified himself. The adversary has spread his hand over all her pleasant things, for she has seen the nations enter her sanctuary, those whom you commanded not to enter your congregation. All her people sigh. They seek bread. They have given their valuables for food to restore life. See, O Lord, and consider, for I am scorned. Now, ultimately, this prayer is a prayer for mercy. He says, Lord, behold my afflictions. Lord, consider my scorn. In other words, we might say, Lord, have mercy on me. (laughs) Which is a good prayer, by the way. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, grace is getting what we don't deserve. Justice is getting what we do deserve. Mercy is holding back that which we truly deserve. We deserve God's judgment, but He is merciful. And all we have to do is ask for His mercy. All we have to do is confess our sin. All we have to do is ask for forgiveness of our sin. And man, He wipes the slate clean. God is merciful. He forgives. He forgets. However, that doesn't eliminate the consequences to our actions. You know, when I confess and repent, I'm halfway expecting God just to, you know, forgive me and like, okay, I'm not going to punish you this time. But you know, it doesn't work that way, does it? There's always a price to pay for sin. Galatians 6, 7 says we're going to reap what we sow. Romans 2, 6 says uh, God's going to render to each man according to his deeds. Look, <laughs> just because we haven't experienced the consequences of our actions doesn't mean it's not coming. Yes, we still confess. Yes, we still repent. But we need to take it a step further and say, okay, Lord, I know your hand of correction is coming and I'm willing to receive it. And you know, I have found this true in my life, and you probably have too, that as soon as I really come to that place where I say that honestly before God, like, okay, God, punish me. I deserve it. That is oftentimes when God shows me that bit of mercy. (laughs) He goes, okay, I'm going to hold back what you really deserve, and I'm just going to give you a taste. But we have to mean it in our heart. And God knows our heart. We're not fooling him, by the way. We can't just mouth these words and and, and God's looking, you idiot, I know what's in your heart. I mean, he would never say that, but uh, he's probably thinking it. No. Back to Lamentations. (laughs) Let's come to the second section. The second section deals with the perspective of someone on the inside of Jerusalem looking out. That's in verses 12 through 22. Take a look. In verse 12 of Lamentations chapter 1, 
It says, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by, behold and see? If there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which has been brought on me, which the Lord has inflicted on me in the day of his fierce anger from above, he has sent fire into my bones and it overpowered them. He has spread a net for my feet and turned me back. He has made me desolate and faint all day. The yoke of my transgressions is bound. They were woven together by his hands and thrust upon my neck. He made my strength fail. The Lord delivered me into the hands of those whom I am not able to withstand. The Lord has trampled underfoot all my mighty men in my midst. He has called an assembly against me to crush my young men. The Lord trampled as in a winepress the virgin daughter of Judah. For these things I weep. My eye, my eye overflows with water because the comforter who should restore my life is far from me. My children are desolate because the enemy prevailed. Zion spreads out her hands, but there is no one to comfort her. The Lord has commanded concerning Jacob that those around him become his adversaries. Jerusalem has become an unclean thing among them. The Lord is righteous, for I rebelled against his commandment. Hear now all peoples and behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. I called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priest and my elders breathed their last in the city while they sought food to restore their life. Now here, 12 times in these eight verses, Jeremiah attributes all of his suffering, all of his pain, all of his anguish, all of the destruction of Jerusalem to the Lord. <laughs> 12 times. He says, this is what God has done to me. This is what the Lord has afflicted me with. And it's true. God did all of that. And he used the Babylonians to accomplish it. Now, I think this should bless each and every one of us because it was God who brought the affliction. It was God who brought the pain and the suffering. And why should that bless us? Well, according to verse 18, it says God is just or God is righteous. There, uh, it, yeah, the, in verse 18, the Lord is righteous or he is just. In other words, he's always going to do what's right, what's righteous, what's just, whether we like it, agree with it, accept it or not. And here it deals with affliction, pain, suffering. Death, destruction, devastation. <laughs> okay, that doesn't thrill me much either. But when I take a step back and recognize and realize that it's God who's allowing it to happen, I have to remember verse 18 that the Lord is righteous. He's just. He doesn't do it out of anger. He doesn't do it out of spite. He doesn't do it out of revenge. Why does he do it? Out of love. He loves us so much, he's not going to let us get away with it. He punishes us when we get out of line. And you know, I got to tell you, God loves me a bunch. <laughs> he loves me so much. But whatever we're going through, whatever we're dealing with, God knows it's not to burn us out. It's to build us up. It's not to grind us down. It's to grow us up. It's for our benefit. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4.17 says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us, far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. It's working for us. James tells us that in James 1, 2. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So there's a byproduct to the testing of our faith. It's for our benefit. It's to grow us. It's to mature us. 
In fact, in Hebrews chapter uh, 12, verse 10, when God chastens us, the Bible says it's for our profit. So, look, when difficulties come in our life, we don't hang our head and fall into the Eeyore complex. Oh, dear. Man, nothing's going right. Life's a bummer. And we call all three of our friends and complain to them. For those of you who do have three. I have one. And she lives with me. Saves me a dime on a phone call. But the point is... The, <laughs> the, point, the, the point is... The point is... Man, our whole countenance is like... Should be radically changed. Because God's going to use it to grow us, to stretch us, to mature us, to benefit us, to bring us to where he wants us to be in our hearts and in our lives. And that is often through adversity. You say, okay, Lord, I'm okay where I'm at. I don't think I need to grow anymore. I think I'm fine just right here. Does anybody understand what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, a few of us, okay. And I'm just here to tell you, don't ever think that because that's when God says, okay, you need a little more. You're not quite done. Isaiah 48, 10 talks about the refiner's fire. <laughs> Man, how you and I are this silly little lump of clay. And God is the potter. And he takes that lump of clay and slams it down on the board and starts kneading it with the palms of his hand, just working it, working it. And then puts us on the wheel and it starts spinning and spinning and spinning. And then he starts applying more pressure and pulling out the, the clay that's not kneaded. And oh man, that hurts. And then the wheel finally stops spinning. You're thinking, oh, praise God, it's over. And then he throws you in the fire then you get put in the kiln, and he turns up the heat, saying, yeah, you need to be glazed a little longer. It's a beautiful picture in Isaiah 48. But then when the fire stops, we cool down. He pulls us out, and man, you are a beautiful vase. And the rest of us are maybe like ashtrays, but the <laughs> point, the point, <laughs> The point is, we've been made by God for a purpose, and He knows what He's doing. So for you and I, it's about keeping that perspective that God's going to use it for our good. Well, uh, as we had mentioned, this, like the first section, this second and final section concludes with a prayer. That's in verses 20 through 22. In Lamentations chapter 1, verse 20, the prayer starts. He says, see, O Lord. Now he starts to pray. See, O Lord, that I am in distress. My soul is troubled. My heart is overturned within me. For I have been very rebellious. Outside the swords, uh, outside the sword bereaves. At home it is like death. They have heard that I sigh with no one to comfort me. All my enemies have heard my trouble. They are glad that you have done it. Bring on the day that you have announced that they may become like me. Let all their wickedness come before you and do to them as you have done to me for all my transgressions, for my sighs are many, and my heart is faint. So here, Jeremiah prays for God to fulfill his promise of coming against his enemies, the Babylonians. And he, of course, will do that. Uh, God will bring down the great Babylonian empire, and he'll use the Medo-Persian empire to do that in 539 BC. So God will fulfill his promises of destroying the wicked, if you will. However, here, he deals with comfort. Did you notice that in verse 21? He said, there is no one to comfort me. Now, back in verse 16, he prayed or he asked for the comforter to restore his life. 
The word comforter was mentioned earlier too, three times, dealing with comfort in light of affliction. And while it is true, God judges sins and he issues consequences for sin, he also brings comfort to the sinner. He comforts those who repent. How? Well, one way God comforts us when we repent and get right with God is by his Holy Spirit. You know, in John 14, 27, Jesus tells us that the comforter is the Holy Spirit. And so while it's true, calamity and trials and tribulation might be happening in our life because of sin. There's no doubt about that. It's equally true. God will send the comforter to bring consolation to our soul. Look, we all mess up. We all fall short. We all sin. Read Romans 3.23. None of us are perfect. Hello? But the truth of the matter is, when we as believers mess up, when we sin, when we fall short, we recognize it, we repent of it. God forgives. Yeah, there's consequences. But we need to ask for His Holy Spirit to comfort us in light of our affliction. James 4.2 says, we have not because we ask not. God, send your spirit to comfort me, to bring consolation to my heart because it's broke because, well, Lord, I've messed up and I realize I'm going to pay the price for it. And God will send his Holy Spirit not only to live inside of us the moment we get saved, but to come upon us, to overflow us, to fill us. That's that epi, the overflowing of God's Spirit in our life to comfort us. 2 Thessalonians 2.17, we're told that it's Jesus who comforts our hearts and establishes us in every good work. 2 Corinthians 7.4, Paul said, I'm filled with comfort. I'm exceedingly joyful in all my tribulation. Acts 9.31, Paul walked in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Now listen, Paul had it rough. Everywhere Paul went, I mean, he had the prison ministry, amen? I mean, everywhere he went, I think the first thing he asked in every town was, hey, how are the prisons here? Because he knew he was going to end up in them. And yet in Acts 9, it says he walked in comfort and had joy in all of his afflictions. Wow. And that's, listen, gang, that is the comfort that we receive from Jesus Christ and the power and the presence of and the person of his Holy Spirit flooding over us like torrents of living water. Father, we are so grateful, so thankful, Lord, for your, just your spirit that, well, Lord, comforts us and consoles us, even in our time of distress, in our time of affliction. Lord, as uh, <laughs> things go south in our life, in our world, Lord, uh, we certainly... We certainly understand that, uh, well, Lord, evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. And Lord, we stand up to do everything we can to prevent it. Lord, we let our voice be heard. We vote according to your Bible. Lord, we proclaim the gospel. We're bold for our faith at work in our community. But Lord, even when affliction comes, we have great joy because of your Holy Spirit comforting our hearts. So Lord, we're just so grateful for that peace, that rest that you give us that only can come from that relationship with you. So Lord, we just pray that you would accomplish your perfect will in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would do whatever you need to do just to draw me closer to you, Lord, to make me more like you. Lord, whatever it takes, whatever you must do, Lord, I, I pray you do it. That you would accomplish your will and your perfect plan in each and every one of our hearts and lives. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.